there's something not right about the death of a political advisor in Queensland this week. 38-year-old disability pensioner Stephen Harrison stood for freedom. He was an anti-COVID mandate campaigner and he detested government rules on lockdowns of any kind. Last Sunday night, police said they were forced to surround Harrison's home in Warwick, Queensland, because of anonymous reports he was seen wielding a gun. Well, after a 12-hour siege, police say they found the dead body of Harrison inside his home, the victim of a gunshot wound to the head. One of Harrison's closest political friends was Federation Party leader Brett Tunbridge, who communicated with him throughout the siege. Brett Tunbridge joins me now. Brett, thank you very much for your time. And we got Brett on the other line. Hello? I've got you, Brett. Thank you very much for your time. Tell us about your tell us about your political party, firstly, and what role Stephen Harrison had inside the party. Okay, I am a uh, state organiser, Queensland state organiser for the Australian Federation Party. We're one of the smaller part political parties in Australia. We are a, uh, a fully democratic party supporting the traditional Australian constitution as it stands. We, uh, we don't believe that the government have been following that constitution for quite a few years, I might add, and uh, we regard that... We regard that uh, things need to be brought back into line to observe the law correctly and have an open and accountable government and parliament to the people of the country. Okay, so don't, don't beat around the bush. What aspects of government control are you mainly campaigning against? First of all, COVID lockdowns was a big one that brought us up because uh, we don't accept that they were legal in any way. They were unconstitutional. They were right. against several aspects of our constitution. And uh, there's many other cases where politicians of the other, the larger parties, the governing party and its opposition, they are not following the rules as set out in the Australian Constitution. Many sections of the Constitution have simply been ignored or breached. There's no recourse for that. The uh, courts appear to be not interested, as, as evidenced by the COVID lockdowns and so forth. They're not interested in following the com Constitution. There's no appropriate discussion within general uh mainstream media circles about this sort of thing so we exist to basically to put things right we ran 68 members in the last federal election we had a very good response to that there were obviously much other parties many other parties involved however we made a pretty good showing and a lot of people are very supportive of us we're, we're only a smaller party obviously okay stephen yeah. harrison what role did he have in that party now, Mr. Harrison was uh, an educated academic. He was a political advisor and constitutional historian. So his actual title was a constitutional historian. He was a, a small, harmless fellow, 7% vision, walked with a cane, hardly a Rambo killing machine kind of guy. Very studious, a large collection of books, probably 6,000 books on constitutionalism and the rule of law. So this is not your average cut loose with a gun kind of fellow that the media may portray these people as. And some others obviously are that kind. This man was the absolute antithesis of that kind of behaviour. So how did the siege begin? Uh, according to the information I have, and I spoke to Stephen for four and a half hours during the uh, uh, situation that occurred, he, uh, he said someone had put, put him put a report to police that he was seen with a firearm uh, police then turned up someone knocked on his door he thought it was apparently a joke and went and had a shower and was about to go to bed then uh he turned the lights out so the next thing the next thing that occurs sirens start loudspeakers start strobe lights start in his window now uh, to give a slight background on the man he was a very timid man he was fearful of uh fearful of police fearful of fearful of a lot of social interaction. He uh, he was very well known in the area and highly respected and, and a huge, it's a huge heartbreak in the community here. But this man was a timid man. He, he believed his home was his sacrosanct castle and unless he chose to let somebody in, there was simply no entry. So 
he he didn't reply. He regarded that as as nonsense. Whatever was going on, he he contacted me as probably one of his close friends via an encrypted messaging app. So nobody else knew he, he, whether he had any uh, electronics at all. Uh, I remained in contact with him for the four and a half hours. He stated that someone had put him in a call, uh, and he didn't understand what it was about. Uh, that's what the police were saying that they they had reports he had a firearm and. They requested that he come out of the uh, house and surrender himself um, to his. But hang on a second, I don't understand this, Brett. In Warwick, which is in uh, a fairly rural area of Queensland, for those who don't it's know, in hell. other parts of the world, it's not foreign for someone to have a gun in a rural area, uh, unless they're threatening another human being with it. Why would someone report him holding it? Well, that's one of the unanswered questions, and. Uh, and I, I put it to him. I said, Stephen, do you have a firearm? Do you have a gun? And he replied to me that he had a toy gel blaster, which are a very realistic looking things. Fires a small, small yellow pellet. Kids play with them. You can shoot. A gel them. blaster. A gel blaster. Correct. I have cited this before. He's, he's, they've set up cans in the backyard and shot the cans off the fence with the, the little thing with my 11 year old son. Not a problem. My understand these things are fully legal here in Queensland. There's no laws to prevent you owning one. I, I believe they're supposed to be kept in a locked cupboard. That's all I know. Uh, they are definitely legal here in Queensland, legal to purchase, legal to own. Okay. There's, there's Tell no me about the conversations there. you had with him. This was text to text. Um, no, it was direct voice. Direct voice. What was he telling you then about his mood and whether he thought he was in trouble? He was frightened. He said he didn't understand what was going on and why he was being being uh, accused of this. He uh, and I uh, and why they were bothering him basically. Why they needed to do all this. Uh, he regarded as persecution style treatment of him. And I said, well, possibly you should just yell out, "Not interested, go away." So, so what were the police doing? Were they just uh, around the property? Or were they being aggressive? No, the police uh, were stating they had the property surrounded. They were using uh, an audio acoustic device. I'm not sure of the uh, nature of the device. However, it emits a shrill high-pitched high pitch whistle, something like a break-in alarm at a, at a commercial premises. Um, this thing nearly burst my eardrums when I heard it over the phone. So, For what was... purpose? To, to, to get him out? OK, well, I spoke to the police area commander at three o'clock in the morning because I, I tried to defuse the situation. Um, and I said, well, my question was the same as yours. And I said, why are you using an acoustic device on a man, a man who is harmless, curled up in a fetal position on his bedroom floor, praying for salvation, praying to God that, that people would leave him alone? Why are you using this on The police commander's commander's statement to me and i've included in this in a formal statement was do we use this equipment to provoke a response so if provoke you have... a response why would you want to provoke a response wouldn't you be trying to de-escalate the situation my my words exactly i said to the uh regional the, to the uh officer the uh commander i said how about you pull back de-escalate the situation, allow the man to get some peace in his head, calm down, he's very emotional. As I said, I was in communication by a device with him. I said, he's very emotional, he's, he's not dangerous. He, he, he informed me, he wanted to hurt nobody, he, wanted, he had no intention whatsoever, and I trust this man, would have trusted this man with my life, with my family's life. And there was no one else in the home? home. There was no one else in the home. He was right. there by himself, lying silent on the floor. He told okay. me. Okay. All of a sudden, just after eight o'clock in the morning, although police officially say no shots were fired, correct. Harrison's body was found inside the home, and police say there are no suspicious circumstances, which is code for he killed himself with a shot to the head. That's what they're saying now. At four thirty. In the morning, after many hours of having this equipment used on him and uh, having uh, all sorts of stuff, neighbours were screaming at the time in other houses to shut the noise down, mind you. 
he, Stephen said to me, he said, I'm so tired, I can't take this torture anymore. He said, I, I, I just wanted to go to sleep, was his one of his one of his replies. And he said, tell everybody in the, in the party, I love them. God bless you. And I said, God bless you, Stephen. And the, the, the call was ended. And that was 4.30 in the morning. And then, as you say, the, the police have released that at 8.30 they've gone in and found him deceased from a gunshot wound. So if no shots were fired, I've got a few questions. Um, and my some of my questions are directed at our police commissioner in Queensland, who stated after a recent uh, event, in, not involved with anything to do with, it, with this, which they pinned on conspiracy theorists, the police commissioner stated and stated publicly on the mainstream media, conspiracy theorists, we're coming for you, we will hunt you down. And that was uh, Katerina Carroll, the Queensland Police Oh, yeah, I've seen all of that coverage, and, and it makes what? sense that you would fear that because of that call to arms, that police are being a little, too, little bit over-aggressive towards people they would consider to be conspiracists. My requests to my requests to offer assistance in uh, in calming the situation were refused. I offered to come in and, and and mediate. No, no, not interested. The man's father, who I called, was outside sitting in a police car. They didn't allow him to talk. They didn't give him a loud speaker. What? Instead, they they did not allow the father to communicate with him, even though he was lying inside quietly listening to what they were doing, and. I, I I don't have any understanding as to why they would have a police in a police uh, a, a, apparently a police negotiator yelling, "Hey, buddy, turn a light on and come on out. We're not going to hurt you." Excuse me, but this man this man was a, a, a man with three university degrees, an intellectual. He'd make you a cup of tea if you were hungry. He'd give you a he'd cook you dinner. This is not the kind of person, this is not a hopped up drug addict whacked out on ice who's going to run out with a machete. Exactly. I, this seems very odd indeed. And I would have thought the Queensland government should be calling an inquiry, an inquiry separate from police to work out exactly what happened and exactly whether some of the tactics used by police during the siege may have caused him to do what he did or what we've been told he did to himself. Uh, I, I can't go any further than that because we can't start accusing people of killing this bloke, but um, I do think that there's enough doubt about what has been concluded by police for some kind of inquiry, don't you? Well, I, I agree. I understand that but what I'm saying and I'm repeating is his words. The man is now dead, so technically it's hearsay, but the man expressed to me the opinion that he wouldn't make the night out. He said, they will kill me. It's 100% political. And he stated to me also that he said they're taking out people who have intellectual capacity so the rest of us know nothing. This man had 6,000 books lining his shelves on laws dating back to to God knows when. He could tell you he could tell you what King Charles I ate for breakfast. OK, all right, let's leave it there. Brett, I've run out of time as well, but we've got to keep in touch and we've got to put continued pressure on the Queensland government to look into this from another angle. I thank you very much for your time. I know you're upset because he was a working colleague and his family very upset, as you've told me off air. All the very best and thank you for telling us about it. Thank you, Chris. Brett Tunbridge from Warwick in Queensland. It doesn't sound right, does it? Now, did someone kill this bloke? I doubt it. I don't know. Were the tactics employed by police too aggressive for someone like Stephen Harrison? Yes, you bet they were. Certainly not allowing his best mate and not allowing his father to talk to him was a grave error of judgment. And I know the police force in Queensland have lost two of their own. And we apologise, well, we're sincerely sorry for that occurring. But you've got to be very careful about how do you treat people in sieges because something terrible could eventuate, and in this case it has. Whether it could have been avoided is the question, and I think it could have been. Let's take a break. This is TNT Radio.